You're listening to the Anxiety Reset Podcast. I'm your host, Georgie Collinson, anxiety mindset coach, gut health expert, and nutritionist. And this is where I share cutting edge ideas and deep discussions to help you find more freedom, calm, and control in your life. This is a woman who almost needs no introduction, the fabulous Lara Bryden. She is a revolutionary in hormones, women's health. Uh, She's a trained naturopath with more than 20 years experience. In this episode, Lara shares with us all about menopause and the perimenopausal period. What we need to know as women as we look towards this window in our lives, whether you are going through that now, you're approaching your 40s, or it's just a time in your life you'd like to learn more about it, or it's just a time in your life that is to come that you'd like to learn more about. No doubt we all have women in our lives who have made that menopausal transition And I certainly have, even with my education around this and understanding the biology, the herbal medicine, the support available with our nutrition, diet and lifestyle, there's still so many fear-based beliefs that I have around around this phase of life. Well, not so much anymore after my chat with Lara, but you'll see I share those because I know I'm not alone in that. I certainly know that it wasn't a pleasant experience for my own mother, for my grandmother either. So one of the key things I really wanted to clear up here is what is fact? What can we understand practically about this transition in our lives that we have to go through as women that can help ease the sense that there's something ending or that this is a bad thing? How can we see it in a whole new constructive way, understanding that there's support out there. It doesn't have to be unpleasant. For some women, there are minimal symptoms, if that at all, and to learn something more about ourselves. You're going to love this episode. This is essential listening for every woman out there. In fact, I think the men could listen to this too and learn so much about this rather mysterious time in a woman's life, the perimenopausal period. I'm going to let Lara take this one away. Well, hello, Lara. I'm so excited to have you here. When I last had you on the show, it was actually my most popular episode. (laughs) So like everyone obviously wants you back. And so I'm really happy that you're here. Thanks for having me. It's good to talk to you again, Georgie. Well, between when we last spoke and now you've released your new book. I remember you mentioned it to me um, a few months ago. So I'm so happy to have it here. I've got it in my hands, the whole repair manual. Yeah. Um, And this is really, I mean, let's just start with what, what was the inspiration behind you writing this book and feeling the need that the world needed this book? Yeah. So this is a book for women over 35. It says over 40 on the cover, but really it's over 35. It's about perimenopause, but I don't put that in the title because most women who are in perimenopause don't know that they are, don't know that that word applies to them. It was similar to my first book. It was in response to what I saw as a gap in the knowledge, I guess, amongst my patients. And I really wanted to, a lot of the work I do is for my patients, kind of from my patients. It's from my conversations with them just trying to explain the process of second puberty starting in our late thirties and what it is and what it isn't and destigmatize it because as we can get into, unfortunately it's a time of, for some women quite confronting in terms of the prospect of menopause and why that's shameful and why that's anxiety provoking, Mm. especially when it comes to, fertility. So I just want to say, I mean, my, there's an, my book doesn't cover fertility, but we just to say right off the bat, it's possible to achieve pregnancy in perimenopause. Being in perimenopause doesn't mean you can't still have a baby. So we'll get that out of the way and then Yay. we'll, yeah, we'll carry on with the conversation. Oh, yeah. I, I, and I'm, I'm really excited about this conversation because for me, I mean, I'm 29 turning 30 this year. And so it's something that still lies ahead in the future. But as you yeah. said, women 35 and up, that's not that far away. Um, and I look at 
this time of the perimenopause, menopause transition with a bit of fear. Yeah. Just looking at it at this time of my life because I've seen what my mum's been through, my grandmother um, on both sides, actually both grandmothers having, it's a real, it's, it's something that seems to be, firstly, I'm, I, I'm so in love with my cycles. <laughs> I love having cycles. I love yes. knowing why I'm feeling the way I'm feeling at different times of the month, um, feeling those natural, that natural ebb and flow. And there's a part of me preemptively a bit concerned about losing that because it helped. It's, it feels like a navigation system for me in my life. And this is what I, you know, I, I work with my clients on that and really embracing, um, knowing your cycle as, as I'm, as I know you do as well. Yes. Um, and so to lose that feels yes. like this power and this gift to be lost. Let's change that narrative. <laughs> well, I guess even in my first book, I have a chapter about perimenopause. I talk about the beauty of cycles. I love them too. You know, I'm a cheerleader for women's hormones. I think our reproductive years are amazing, whether or not we have a baby or not, whether we just have cycles and hormones. In a way, it's all more beautiful, more amazing because it has to end. There is an end to it by, you know, by around 50, possibly in our mid 40s. That's normal for periods to stop by then, anywhere between 45 to 55. It's in our genetic blueprint. And I talk about that in the book. We evolved to do this. It's not just about getting too old or it's certainly, I'm really trying to debunk the idea that it's if you have a slightly earlier menopause, that it's somehow something you've done wrong. It's nothing to do with that. A lot of it's genetically programmed. And yeah, I think it's possible to celebrate menstruation and cycling and at the same time hold space for it does end. And that makes it all the more special when we were in our reproductive years. I have, a, as you saw in the book, I have a chapter called Cycle While You Can. Our 40s are a time to be cycling because we've only got 10 years left to do it. Yes. And actually... I, I mean, I have a question on that. I'm like, should I bring that up now? Yeah. <laughs> I might, I might wait. I might wait and bring that up later. But okay. um, something I do want to ask you about is, you know, with menopause, are we just doomed for this complete dysfunction of our hormones and our, you know, our metabolism that comes with that, that ending of the menstrual or the menstruating years? Um, are, we, are we doomed for, I mean, certainly some things that possibly superficially, but, uh, you know, general health concerns too about things like weight gain that you often see happen. Is that something that just is inevitable and we just have to accept it? We're not doomed <laughs> in any respect, but yeah, I mean, it's, <laughs> there is a biological reality, which is, losing, although it's normal, it's not a deficiency, you know, when the, the way I see it now here, I'll just back up. <laughs> the way I look at it now as a biologist, as an evolutionary biologist, as a woman almost through into menopause, I feel now it's kind of weird perspective wise, but like the baseline female physiology is pre-puberty and menopause. Like we have this baseline, it's still female physiology. It's, it's not like we are men now or anything. It's still, and, but then for about three or four decades, we have our reproductive years, which is probably about half our life, might be a little bit less. We have years where we're actively cycling, actively making a lot of estrogen and way even more progesterone. And those are important years that helps us build metabolic reserve. But then it, it has to end at some point. It's like a party, a fun party that has to eventually end. And then we revert to our baseline. And there's several lines of evidence to think we can be healthy in that baseline, even without taking hormones. Now, as you saw in the book, I'm very, I'm supportive of taking hormones for women who do. And I actually, you know, take something myself. We can talk about that. It's not, but it's, it's still, it's not the same as replacement. It's about understanding that it's normal to be in a lower hormone state and the metabolic changes that come with that do really what happens, I guess, in its simplest form is a, a slight shift, or in some cases, a more extreme shift to insulin resistance or prediabetes. You saw how much I talked about that in the book. That is part of what happens in a lower estrogen state because estrogen is so insulin sensitizing. It kind of is women's, um, women of reproductive age, it's your super superpower to have this kind of built-in protective mechanism against insulin resistance to some extent. 
Right. And can, I mean, firstly, I just want to say, you've just flipped that perspective for me yeah. already by saying, we're just going back to our baseline. Yeah. You're just in this like fun zone at the moment. And then you go back to your baseline. Yeah. I really like that because I'm like, oh yeah, I did live like a few, you know, 12, 13 years yeah. of my life without menstruating yes. already. And it was fine. <laughs> did you see my return to girlhood section in the book about this re rediscovering? Yeah. Yeah. It that's more emotionally, I guess. I mean, it, it, menopause is not exactly the same as childhood, obviously, in terms of physiology, but there is something about, and I, I quote a few authors talking about it as well, this capt recapture of an authentic self that existed pre-puberty. And it's been quite delightful, actually. <laughs> it's been quite a, yeah, for me personally, it's been quite an interesting part of the process. I have a few yeah. quotes about that. So it's not all, you know, that, that just takes away this sense of the, this loss. It's like, it's not loss. It's just a return to something else or a, a new, a new chapter, I suppose. Um, can you tell, so you've mentioned this element of uh, insulin um, sensitivity that can be yes. influenced as we go through that menopausal transition or perimenopause. Yeah. What else, what else are the key players here just to outline mm. this for our listeners? For sure. Everything, it's a recalibration of every system, including our energy system, so insulin sensitivity, including our immune system, which is why menopause, perimenopause is a time of risk, a risky time for the flare up of, for example, autoimmune thyroid disease, similar to postpartum as another risky window for that. That would be something like Hashimoto's thyroid disease. Other immune conditions can flare. I talk about menopausal allergies flaring during this recalibration time. The other system that's very much affected, very important for this podcast, is the brain, the nervous system. It's a recalibration of the brain. And therefore, it is a time of increased risk of anxiety and depression and potentially other mental health problems. But the good news is what the research shows is after the transition time, once you get several, a few years past the final period, the risk drops back down to normal or even better than normal. So I feel like that's an important part of this explanation is that some of the symptoms, which hopefully will be helped by the treatments I provided, it's all there. The symptoms are temporary. Yeah. And so what you're saying is there are certain realities, biological realities that we can't ignore that yes. of course are going to be impacting us. There might be some discomfort. There may be some symptoms and things that pop up, um, but we can potentially minimize and support that. There's a lot yes. that we can do with our diet, with our lifestyle, herbs, and even, even things like hormones. Um, let's talk about HRT, hormone yeah. replacement therapy. Where do you see that fitting into this management yeah. time? Well, first of all, it's not called that anymore. And <laughs> it's a little change, but it's funny because almost every interview I've done this week, the interviewer has said hormone replacement therapy. And every time I'm just a little annoying person going, actually the word, the name has changed, with it's, which I think signals a change in thinking about it. Replacement implies that it's a deficiency, right? That it's correcting something that's deficient. It would be similar to you know, thyroid replacement. If your thyroid is underactive, then you have to take thyroid hormone to be normal. Whereas with menopause, it's normal to have lower estrogen and progesterone. So it's quite a different conversation. It's about do you and for how long and what type of estrogen and or progesterone do you take to feel better or to perhaps reduce the risk of osteoporosis or things like that. But it's a therapeutic decision. It's not a correcting a deficiency. And I just, mm. I really, I feel like that's quite important for women to understand. No, I definitely appreciate you correcting yeah. that. I love it, Lara. Like, <laughs> yeah. feel free you're not, to correct You're me not alone. Time. Actually, everyone still says HRT. So, and I am, I think it's fair to say I'm very flexible in my thinking around it. Like I, just because I've, well, I've had so many thousands of patients that I've talked to about it and, you know, helped them through the decision-making process. And it, there's so many different ways it can be. Some women don't really don't require anything like that. Like they're really fine. And some women require 
definitely require it. It could be, you know, life saving for them in terms of symptoms like mood and sleep and hot flushes. So there's quite a wide variation in terms of, you know, how that's going to be for any individual. It's going to depend on genetics and just menstrual history, whether you took the pill or not, the pill can increase the likelihood of, you know, strong symptoms in perimenopause. There's things like a stress level and exposure to environmental toxins and whether you have insulin resistance or not, which is obviously something I talk about because insulin resistance increases symptoms. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, the process of perimenopause increases insulin resistance. So it really does become this little vicious cycle that is a place to intervene potentially. Mm. So tell me more about the pill potentially impacting uh symptoms of perimenopause is there a mechanism of action that you understand there that plays into it i think there's several things i would i would probably position that as kind of recent pill use i give a patient story who the example of for example the, the patient story i gave is someone who was on the pill through her 40s into her early 50s and therefore having fake periods or pill bleeds and had gone through menopause at some point, but didn't know when, you know, undetected. And then, so meanwhile, was in menopause, but the meanwhile, the high dose of the pill estrogen, which is actually a synthetic estrogen, not as nice as any kind of menopausal hormone therapy and higher dose too than any kind of menopausal hormone therapy. So when, she, in her case, when she stopped the pills, she went over what I'm calling, what I call in the book, the estrogen, estrogen cliff, which is just straight from quite high synthetic estrogen to very little estrogen. And that, because estrogen is addictive, that can create intense hot flushes in her case and mood instability. As you can imagine, there's not a lot of research around the use of hormonal birth control, the history of hormonal birth control and perimenopause experience. I'd like to see more of that research come. I think some of the mechanisms, I just, I think an ideal situation in our forties is if we can be in that situation where our estrogen, we're metabolizing estrogen well, and maybe our estrogen is slowly, slowly going down. We're weaning off it slowly through our forties. That would be ideal. Unfortunately, if you're on, you know, a high dose estrogen pill, that, that is a different situation. Also, some women have high estrogen and perimenopause, not just from the pill, but just from themselves. There is also this scenario of quite a high estrogen version of perimenopause, which is associated with very heavy periods, a histamine, mast cell reaction, often a lot of mood symptoms. Mm. And that's another example of how estrogen is addictive. And then going from that place of high estrogen to finally the last period and period stopping can also be quite rough. So hopefully that starts to give you a picture, like there's different roots or different ways to navigate menopause and some are easier than others. Well, absolutely. And I mean, this is, we're talking about hormones here. They are beautifully complex. And this is, I imagine, I mean, why you've written books on this stuff. Like it's not just a simple answer. Um, I'm curious. So it sounds like your feelings towards synthetic hormones in the pill versus which we talked about at length in our last yeah episode. last time so go yeah. listen back to that episode anyone yeah to hear that discussion versus synthetic hormones in um in supporting the perimenopausal period um that is or that transition that's a different situation you mentioned because of the the, the amount of dose it's really about the type so the type. most modern menopausal therapy, hormone therapy is body identical or what used to be called bioidentical. There's a whole history to this, of course, but Mm -hmm. for what it's worth in present day in Australia, New Zealand, the U S Canada, the standard hormone therapy prescription from the doctor is likely to be body identical, which means hormones that are exactly identical to human estradiol. That's our estrogen and progesterone. So in Australia, that would be called, uh, for example, brand names would be a, an estrogen patch, something like Estradot, that's bi- body identical estradiol. In Australia, pro- progesterone is called Prometrium. That's the preferred progestin, or like that's the preferred companion to estrogen. 
even from the conventional perspective these days because it's so much safer for blood clots, for breast cancer. For example, most progestins slightly increase the risk of breast cancer. Progesterone, real progesterone, slightly decreases the risk or possibly more than slightly decreases the risk. So that's taken a while. It's taken longer than I expected for, I guess, if you will, mainstream to catch up to that. But that's where we're at currently. So just to contrast that to the pill or really any type of hormonal birth control, which do not use body identical hormones. A couple of the pills use body identical estrogen, but all of them use progestin rather than progesterone, mainly because progesterone can't really be used for contraception. So it's such a different thing. Like just in the first scenario in with the pill, you've got some contraceptive drugs, which are not real hormones being used to suppress ovarian function, induce a temporary chemical menopause, and then give back these hormone-like drugs, which are not as good as real hormones, to young women. <laughs> you know, obviously that's in my, in my thinking, that's one scenario. Then with perimenopause, menopause, it's, a, it's more gauging the symptoms, deciding at what point, based on symptoms or risk to bones or other factors, is it worth coming in with some arguably natural hormones to support that transition, especially for, I'll say one situation when it is almost certainly worth taking hormone therapy is early menopause or surgically induced menopause before 45, as in period stopping before 45. The research is pretty clear on that, I think, unless there's a reason that you can't. I think if you're in that situation and the doctor is offering hopefully a body identical estrogen and progesterone, it's a good idea to take it. And are all of our um, body identical estrogens, are they coming from the urine of pregnant mares? No, gosh, no, 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 no. So I, there's a section about Premarin in the book, which you would have seen. So Premarin, so, and I was around then, right? Like I've been practicing since the mid, since the mid 90s. So that was the drug that was used back then. It's, that's the one that's extracted from pregnant mares, hence the name. And it's not, it doesn't actually contain estradiol. It contains estrone and some equivalents, like some horse estrogens it's, it's, and some androgens. It's, it's about, I think I say in the book, about 30 different hormones, only a couple of which are the same as human hormones. So, and it's oral as well, which is actually really not a safe way to ever take estrogens. So that, I mean, occasionally I've run into someone who's still been prescribed that, but that drug is generally not given anymore. And that was the drug that, was being studied a couple, you know, a couple decades ago with the Women's Health, Health Initiative study and that drug plus progestins. So just to compare and contrast, it really couldn't be more different. Modern hormone yeah. therapy is transdermal through the skin, estradiol, human, well, not derived from humans, but identical to human estradiol plus body identical progesterone in capsule form. Estrogen's best through the skin, transdermal, progesterone, usually best orally, but can be taken vaginally or other ways as well. What's the link between taking that estrogen orally? Where's the warning? Blood clots in the liver. It forms dangerous blood clotting factors. Yeah. So it's, and that's true for the pill, right? I should, and, and that's true for oral hormone therapy. So wow. that's pretty well established now. Most Certainly in the menopause sphere, it's transdermal is, yeah, is, um, through the skin is much safer. Thank you so much for clarifying that because it's really fascinating. And there's so many like different ideas around this stuff, especially like all synthetic hormones are bad or all, well, I mean, well, actually it sounds like, you know, bioidentical, say for example, I've had clients not want to take their thyroxine, which is a thyroid, thyroid um, support. Um, I feel you've got something to say on well, that. Well, I think. I think if uh, generally, if, if the doctor says you need thyroid, it's probably a good idea to take it, but yeah. 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 <laughs> and it, and it, it is, it is a natural hormone. The thyroxine yes. is natural. Yeah. So it doesn't have to be seen as you're taking this hormone replacement therapy or something like that. You're taking with the thyroid situation. Um, it's almost like a supplement. The thyroid is more of a true replacement situation. I mean, that's remedying a deficiency in thyroid hormone. 
and with a natural hormone. So I think I have a section about thyroid disease in my book. I think in general, I think it's important to take thyroid hormone if you need it. That said, there was for a while over the last 15 or 20 years, a little bit of potentially over prescription of thyroid hormone, which has to factor into the conversation as well. I think it's important to be a little bit careful about that and not take it Take it if you need it, but don't take it if you don't need it. <laughs> yeah, so. I suppose, sorry, to correct yeah. what I was saying earlier, yeah. I think it's more the idea that you're taking this medication that's having, you know, all these, and, and it doesn't have to be seen that way when no. it comes to thyroid hormone. And I think it sounds similar for what you're describing with um, the estrogen support there too. Yeah, again, but um, it's, the, the main difference is that the low, the low estrogen of menopause is normal. So that's where it gets a little more complicated, right? Like that's where we're not trying to correct it or bring it up to premenopausal levels. Definitely. We're just trying to use enough to relieve symptoms or reduce risk to bones. And all of that depends on the individual. And at some point we want to be calibrating to the lower estrogen. Yes. Good point. Yes. Yes. That's the normal thing is we, we, we don't want to be operating the estradiol levels we had in our 20s for the rest of our lives. Like that is not, yeah, you don't want is in your 50s and 60s, you don't want the estrogen of a 20 year old. That's not good for the body, yeah. I would argue. Yeah. Now, is it all about estrogen or do we need to factor yeah. in progesterone? Of course. Well? <laughs> Definitely. Progesterone is just as important as estrogen, which does go against the conventional narrative somewhat. I'll, I'll mention my colleague, Professor Geraldine Pryor, who's a Canadian endocrinologist who helped me with this book. She is a scientist as well. She is so passionate about progesterone. She's literally been working for four decades to try to bring progesterone on even par with estrogen in, in everything. So she's just released a new paper about that, actually, talking about the partnership between them. I cover quite a lot of that in my book. I talk about various conditions perimenopausal symptoms that respond to progesterone alone Mm -hmm. with no estrogen, which is arguably a safer strategy because if anything, progesterone appears to reduce the risk of breast cancer. It carries no clotting risk, things like that. It's, It's quite gentle and easy to use, although occasionally some women have a negative mood reaction to it, but most women feel good on it in terms of mood and sleep. And that goes, just to clarify that, I'm talking about progesterone, real progesterone, i.e. Prometria, not the progestin you get in the mini pill or the hormonal IUD Mm. or any type of hormonal birth control. And that's easy to figure out just by looking at the brand name. I have a table, I I provide a, a table in the book where I list all different brand names of different hormone therapy products that are available. And so readers can check what they're taking and, and see if it's body identical or not. Is there anything that we can do? Cause obviously like when we are in our cycling years yes. and that's where the cycle while you can kind of comes in, yes. that's where we're making our natural progesterone. And that's yes. obviously a wonderful thing that we can do for our own bodies. And there's ways that we can sort of support ovulation, regular cycles, all of that to, to enhance this progesterone production. Absolutely. But when we are no longer ovulating is prometrium or a bioidentical progesterone our only option or are there things that we can do where's the progesterone coming from otherwise at some point it's our only option yeah like i just described in the book progesterone is the hormone we lose pretty absolutely at some point with the perimenopause transition estrogen we only lose partially because we can still keep making estrogen for the rest of our lives in fact we have to because we need some amount of estrogen just to stay alive really um so in that sense, I mean, arguably estrogen is a, maybe a little bit more important than progesterone, although Professor Pryor wouldn't like to hear me say that. But yes, we, we lose, it, ovulation is really the only way to make a significant amount of progesterone. And as we progress through the phases of perimenopause, the four phases I talk about in my book, it becomes harder and harder to make it. We start having cycles where we make, we're still ovulating, for example, but where our luteal phase is shorter or the progesterone we make even during that luteal phase is less. So we just, progesterone starts stepping down. At some point, 
closer to the final period, we'll start having bleeds that are anovulatory. So just an estrogen withdrawal bleed, no, no ovulation, no luteal phase, no progesterone. And some women can ride that out. Just to say again, I mean, some, um, that's, gonna, that's the beginning of the recalibration of the brain, for example, because the brain is quite sensitive to progesterone. So at that point, it depends on the individual. And in answer to your question, I mean, there's ways to enhance it for as long as possible. I mean, we can be being as healthy as we can, not having insulin resistance, maybe taking the herbal medicine Vitex, for example, can keep progesterone going for a little bit longer, but at some point it's just going to stop. And then the question is, are, are we okay? Can we just recalibrate to that? Or do we need to take it for symptoms like heavy period or periods or insomnia or mm. migraines? Yeah, because so, everyone listening to this um, podcast will be happy to know that progesterone has a very calming effect on the brain. And it's, yes. the, it's the absence of that calming effect, right? Where we can possibly experience more anxiety and other mood changes. Yeah. Progesterone has a calming effect, often an antihistamine calming effect as well. So can relieve symptoms of what are referred to as symptoms of estrogen dominance, even though I don't usually use that term, but a lot of people are kind of familiar with that idea of what that might be like. Mm. And so are we looking at a future where, you know, as we, as we look at those post menopausal years, because I can understand maybe taking Prometrium for a 10 year period, or is it the rest of your life? And when no. you're eighties, you're still taking. Oh no. Prometrium? Well, I'm going to say no. Gerilyn says seven years. Okay. So, so of course this is all pending future research and what, you know, what we find out in the coming decades about what is the best thing. But at this stage, there's no hard and fast rule, but I would say, I, I don't think women need to expect to take anything for more than five or 10 years. So the advantage, what Geraldine says about progesterone, and I am taking some Prometrium, so I can share that with you um, to help with sleep and some of the hot flushes. Uh, she says that usually about seven years through that final stages of perimenopause and the first few years of menopause. And the good thing about progesterone is unlike estrogen, it's not addictive. So you can stop at any time and, and just like try stopping it and see how am I, am, you know, am I sleeping? Am I flushing? As opposed to if you've been on an estrogen patch and there's nothing wrong with that, it's fine to be on an estrogen patch. But if that's the case, then at some point, whenever you decide to stop, if you decide to stop, you really do need to wean it down because otherwise stopping estrogen suddenly can go over the estrogen cliff and trigger hot flushes. And Professor Pryor recommends staying on progesterone while you're weaning down the estrogen. So you have the, the benefits of progesterone and then you can just stop progesterone anytime. So you can think of progesterone as protective as yes. you kind of go through that phase. And then I imagine it's a bit of trial and error and just seeing how you go and you can always step up a notch if you needed to go back on the estrogen patches. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. But I like that about protective. Progesterone is very sheltering. That's the kind of words that come to mind. It's um, shelters from migraines, shelters from the ups and downs of estrogen. Maybe even the ups and downs of life <laughs> to, some, to some degree. It does help to support the HPA or stress support axis. I think that destabilization of the HPA or adrenal axis during our 40s and the destabilization of sleep is a big part of the you know, anxiety stress that can happen during mm. these years. It can be a tricky decade for some women, not for everyone, but yeah. it it really can. And I've seen that with my own patients. I can certainly sympathize. And I, I just want to, I'm just segueing now into something I want to talk about. Please um, do. Because what happens is if women are feeling under pressure, maybe not sleeping, not coping with stress as well as they used to, alcohol can enter the picture. I was and, about to ask you about that. <laughs> yeah. How weird is that? That was my next question. <laughs> yeah. And it is, corrosive to the hormonal system. Like, I, I just don't know how else to say it. And I, I've had multiple conversations with my interviews over the last couple of weeks about alcohol. It's hard to be the messenger of this. And I get it. You know, I, I also have definitely, you know, enjoyed a few drinks in the week and that that's been part of my life as well. It's, but 
for myself and for a lot of the pe people I've talked to recently, once you hit like 40, 41, 42, 45, you might find you just feel so much better with no alcohol at all. It's yeah. So not even like looking at, you know, I always think about the research on the Mediterranean diet and how it's like, well, you know, that, that standard glass of wine. So it's about half of what we generally pour ourselves of red wine has the polyphenols that have the antioxidants yeah. that are protective for our heart health and all of these right. things. But even Did that it, here and there could still be having an impact if oh, we're yeah. sensitive. Oh yeah. Did you see that? So I, debunked that idea that alcohol is healthy. Put it this way, there's, we need to stop saying alcohol is healthy. In no universe is it healthy apart from it's fun. You know, it's, I guess, relaxing, but it, there's plenty of other ways to get polyphenols. Yeah. And it's not healthy. It's, you know, arguably not that bad depending on who you are, but I'm just pointing out that in these vulnerable years when the brain is rewiring and recalibrating and sleep is disturbed, now is the time to probably have a break. And then once you hit 55 or, you know, a couple of years past your final period, you might find suddenly, you know, a few glasses of wine in a week are not a problem anymore. Yeah. 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 So just really like giving yourself all the support at that time, if you, if you are not, not coping very well, if you yeah. are getting symptoms, I suppose there would be always exceptions to the rule and some people who seem to be able to cope with that and they're fine. Um, what about caffeine in this picture too? I never conflate alcohol and caffeine. In my view, they're quite different. Mm -hmm. Alcohol is a standalone, <laughs> quite troubling, you know, corrosive substance. Co coffee, it depends. Obviously, if you're not sleeping, definitely coffee in the afternoon is not going to help the situation. I've observed that some women tend to have kind of a, for some, whatever reason, a negative kind of autoimmune reaction to coffee, that would be the minority, but that, that's since, so I would certainly acknowledge that some women for a combination of reasons, maybe don't feel well on coffee, but in general, as a blanket statement, I would say coffee is not harmful. Mm. And if anything, the research is potentially that it, it does have some protective benefits on health. So really just to differentiate, separate coffee and alcohol out from each other, they, they're different. Yeah. And well yeah. I always say, you know, with my audience in particular, it is going to, you know, influence your cortisol levels and things that possibly we don't need more of a stimulation to, um, and the sleep impact as well with the caffeine. Um, but I, I understand for certainly many people, it, it can be okay as long as we're not going crazy with it and having lots of cups of coffee in a day. Yeah. And it's about picking prioritizing, I guess. I just, with my own patients, I often find they're so grateful when I say you can still have coffee. <laughs> so then they're like, okay, I got it. You know, the wine, no, you know, the desserts, the sugar, I'm going to, you know, I'm, and then they're like, I'm going to move my body. Yeah. But I, can still have, I can still have my morning coffee. And it just, it seems to make it all easier, but yeah, uh, you know, just rather yeah, than having yeah. a long laundry list of things to avoid, which can be a little bit overwhelming. The yeah. one thing I want to emphasize, because I don't know if this has come through yet from what we our conversation. This is a temporary transition, right? I talk about this again and again in the book. This, it's not always going to be like this. So this, this new sleep problem, this new anxiety, this new not coping. Hopefully it will improve with the treatments I'm recommending. So of course you shouldn't have to really suffer it at all, but also keep in mind, big picture, this is only going to be for the next on average, you know, six to seven years, and then you're going to be through it. And then yeah. it's going to be a much more stable time with your health. So in that sense, if you're thinking about changes you have to make or supplements to take, I think knowing that it's only for some number of years rather than forever helps. Are there some cases where those hot flushes or certain symptoms or the insomnia can continue into say your sixties? The short answer, yes. There's a little bit of research to suggest hot flushes can continue really. Usually they're over within a few years, kind of three to four years is the average. Mm. Up to 10 years is kind of what the research suggests. I mean, occasionally you hear someone claiming they're still flushing 20 years later. I don't, I think when that happens, that's other factors going on. That's stress, that could be thyroid, that's 
other on average it's no it's not going to last into your 60s or 70s no and if it is investigate other yes reasons absolutely so there's no reason why a woman who is generally looking after herself because we're never going to all do this perfectly but generally yeah. you know minimizing the alcohol um looking after her diet, moving her body, getting enough sleep as much as she can. Um, there's no reason why she shouldn't expect to eventually reach a calibration point where say in her later half of her fifties, she is feeling more stable with things. Even better than that. Those things you just mentioned, she may be fine the whole way through. So I don't want to make it sound like these symptoms, any of them, the hot flushes or anything are inevitable. Some women cruise through with absolutely nothing. And a statistic that I have is just a rough guess, but from my patients, even when they're in the thick of it, like usually the symptoms are worse about two or three years before the final period, night sweats, potentially, you know, migraines, hot flushes, maybe some anxiety in that time. I have, with my prescriptions, I have it sort of in layers, right? So you start with Magnesium, taurine, that's my combination. No alcohol if you can do it. Move your body, help, you know, get some morning light, stabilize your blood sugar, kind of basic things like that. And that's level one. And then level two would be take some progesterone. Level three would be take some, add some estrogen to the progesterone, plus all the other things, plus the magnesium and taurine and all the other things. That level one of the, of the women who come to me for help, 50% of them, that's all they need. They take their magnesium powder with taurine, they quit alcohol, and they're fine. Like, they're actually fine. That, that can happen. Now, that's not to make people feel bad if that didn't work for them. I mean, everyone's different, but I'm just saying that's definitely a possibility. Mm, that's really, no, that's really inspiring and, and lovely to know because what I'm really hearing from this discussion, sometimes I think, like, there's almost this frustration or anger that can arise at the way that things are with our female biology in the sense of like, we're just, we have to go through this annoying thing and it's, it's so frustrating. Um, why does this happen? And why are so many of us needing something that is, you know, not a hundred percent natural. If you think of like, how did people get through this when we didn't have um, th those medical options or, or the, the hormones that you mentioned, you know, the bioidentical hormones, but say the alcohol factor, for example, might not be something that is also natural for our bodies to deal with. Yeah. So there's something going on called evolutionary mismatch. Mm -hmm. I'll just summarize a few points in my book. Please do. Yeah. So first of all, to debunk the idea that we're just living longer now and our ancestors didn't go through menopause, that is not the case. This I provide several lines of evidence to suggest that at least some of us were always getting through till our 70s or 80s. And in fact, there's a case to be made that a longer human lifespan may have evolved because of menopause, because women are so productive in our post-reproductive years. So basically, menopause has been there as long as we've been human. And from what we know from modern forager groups, they do not report symptoms with menopause. They report menopause, period stopping in your late 40s, but they're happy about it. Like, there's, you know, there's, there are no symptoms. And the symptoms do seem to be really only reported in the last kind of couple hundred years in European cultures. I think there's a few things going on with it. I, I think some of it is what's called evolutionary mismatch. You know, it's this hormonal recalibration we have to go through. It shouldn't necessarily be associated with symptoms, except potentially in the food environment that makes us more vulnerable to insulin resistance, for example, or in the environment where we're exposed to environmental toxins. There's actually quite a bit of research about environmental toxins and menopausal symptoms, of which is not within our control. One of the examples, which I do list in the book, but a few people I've talked to said they tried to ignore it because they found it too disturbing, <laughs> which is fair enough, is this idea that a um, couple, pa couple papers, research papers to suggest that one of the mechanisms of menopausal anxiety and symptoms is actually the liberation of stored lead from the bones oh. during the increased bone turnover as our estrogen goes down and our bone turnover goes up, right? That's normal. So we start liberating minerals from the bone. Like obviously we try to manage that and, but 
what happens is for those of us who were born in the 60s and maybe lived in houses with you know lead solder and the pipes and we still had when i was a kid we still had lead you know leaded gasoline which is not a thing that hasn't been a thing since then mm. so what happens when you're exposed to lead some of it's ex stored in the bones which is good it's, it sequesters it away but then at menopause we get this release now that's just one example of why our ancestors wouldn't have had that right so they may not have been reporting all the anxiety and sleep problems and yeah oh my god you blow my mind with all of this yeah. stuff so could it potentially be a good idea to go through like support the liver and go th and support those detox pathways if that's potentially happening okay well i can tell you that i'm personally conscious of that yeah of heavy metal toxins being mobilizing from my bones just because mm -hmm. of where i'm at so i'm personally for that reason and, and other reasons you know i am doing a combination of n-acetylcysteine yeah selenium and glycine those are the nutrients that have been studied somewhat for helping to gently assist with detoxification of lead yeah. and protecting from the damage of those things in our bodies yeah. um is there a preferred uh way of monitoring that in your body that you tend to use or that you would use for yourself or, or patients if that's uh, you know we can do hair mineral analysis we can do blood tests what do you prefer or do you do it at all i haven't been monitoring it in myself yeah. or patients i think mainly because it's kind of as you know kind of tricky to pick it up um yeah. If it's in the bones, you can't measure it at all. If it's liberated and in the blood, you might get lucky and see it in the serum. I guess you might see it in the hair. I don't do a lot of hair mineral analysis. I just don't do it. I just, I'm not used to interpreting it, but that you know, could be an option, I guess. Mm, yeah. yeah, okay. Um, so can I just pull back to something? I just yeah. want to like recap this for yes. anyone that missed it because you just unloaded all these amazing ideas about yeah. what menopause means or what, what no longer being in your menstrual phase means yeah. um menstruating years this idea that women are so productive yes post menopause gives yeah. me this sense of like oh my god there's hope because i've always had this idea and it, it, it is partly even from my training and what a lot of the the physiology and you know those studies sort of tell us is almost like everything just declines basically mm -hmm. and it's like ah oh, we're on this just slow decline so to hear that it's really exciting and inspiring um the idea that we might be more productive in those years well that's what the research shows so in modern forager groups women in their 50s 60s and 70s all those those three decades after menopause gather more food than any other demographic per person like they gather more calories for the group than the young men than the old men than the young women well the young women are busy having babies right so the older women you know have to step in to do all the jobs that the young women can because they're breastfeeding half yeah. the time so it, it's and it i think this has been I, re I reference a book in my book another book called um slow moon rises i think that's the name of it she talks about she goes into this in depth about the importance of menopausal women in homo sapiens hominid groups like early groups as we were evolving it just made everything possible to have those skilled capable individuals who can get a lot done and don't need as much food this is another little superpower potentially i mean having a lower slightly slower metabolic rate we see that as a liability because it can make us gain weight but also from an evolutionary perspective that was actually a superpower <laughs> that we you know have a slower metabolism compared to women of reproductive age again i kind of think of it as our sort of baseline metabolism mm. so it's pretty interesting. and if you think about it everyone i've talked to when they really think about it they kind of nod everyone knows those women in your life in their 50s 60s even 70s who are seriously getting stuff done like volunteering you know organizing the group just holding everything together even if it's just for the family so yeah. that's the that's that's the archetype too i, I love that <laughs> now this brings in another contrasting point which i'm going to share my own personal um story here just from yeah. recent times because I think it's, it's, it's common and, and relevant. So I was um, recently having a blood tests done and my iron was very, very low. My ferritin stores were down to 12, which for anyone listening, um, the minimum 
on a standard test is 30. So you want to be at least above 30, but ideally as naturopaths, we would say above 50 would be yeah. better. Um, so mine's very low. And she, I was sort of saying to her, why, why is this? Because I eat iron containing foods. I look, I do look after my digestion. Um, potentially, you know, stress can, can alter that and alter the absorption of those nutrients. But um, I was saying to her, you know, why, why is it that so many of us women are getting the, this low iron and possibly requiring uh, non-natural forms to, to maintain it, such as taking yeah. a supplement, taking extra iron or, or even getting an iron infusion. Um, and her, her theory was that, you know, women aren't meant to be bleeding as much as we do in the sense of, cause I'm just thinking about that idea of cycle while you can, cause it's how we make our hormones, it's how we make our yeah. progesterone. She's saying, well, you know, going back a few decades or more, um, women were having more babies younger. So we were bleeding yet less and we were breastfeeding. Um, and so during those times, not bleeding. What are your thoughts on that, Laura? Well, okay. So first of all, actually pregnancy and breastfeeding are also times of high iron demand. So yeah. going into the baby and into the breast true. milk. So yeah. look, that, that sort of narrative that women never used to bleed as much comes up a lot. I talk about that in period repair manual. It is true that our ancestors, yeah, spent a lot more time pregnant and breastfeeding. They did, they did still have periods though. Periods. I mean, we know that from forager groups, they have, they have cycles, but I guess when it comes in terms, when we try to fit that into our modern experience, we're just, there's no way to mimic that state, if you know what I mean. Like, if, what, what, I guess when that narrative is used to then justify hormonal birth control, then that's where I basically say it breaks down because there's no, taking the pill is not the same as, mm. or taking the hormonal yes. ID is not the same as being pregnant or breastfeeding. Because I saw it going to that place of, yes. it's okay to skip your periods on the right. pill. Right, no. All. So, yeah. I mean, that's where I, I acknowledge that our ancestors had a different experience than we do. But when it gets to ergo, therefore, take, the pill, I'm like, actually, that doesn't make any sense because mainly because the hormones of pregnancy are quite beneficial. That's our same estrogen and progesterone. And as we've discussed, there's no real estrogen and progesterone in any type of hormonal birth control. So I guess the way I say it is during our reproductive years, whether we're cycling and or pregnant is the time the body is expecting to be exposed to quite a lot of estrogen and progesterone and is kind of calibrated to that, is benefiting from that. Mm. But still, it seems like this conundrum to me why we all struggle with, like so many of us, sorry, it's not all women, but so many of us do struggle with our iron levels. Um, do you have any thoughts on that particular piece? Well, it is a lot of its periods. I mean, sometimes yeah. I think periods are heavier than they need to be. So I would argue, well, just very simply, you know, I guess heavy cow's dairy intake, this wouldn't necessarily be you, but like, I think our modern diet tends to make periods heavier than they need to be. And it is true that menstrual bleeding is the primary cause of iron deficiency in women. So I, I think it's important to keep an eye on it, try to keep the periods as light as possible. Yeah. And it's just one of those biological realities that we have to deal yeah. with. Yeah. 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 So interesting. Um, oh my gosh. Thank you so much, Lara. Like you are always, you've flipped this around for me and that's <laughs> what I was hoping. Cause I just, yeah. there, it is easy to, to, to be pulled into the narrative that perimenopause menopause is like this. We're losing something. We're going through this horrible change and it's yeah. all going to be awful, but really brilliant to see um, so clearly w what these options are for ourselves. One last question I do yes. have. Um, we've mentioned alcohol, is that which is obviously a huge one. Are there any? Is there any one particular diet change that you think is really important for women to understand at this time, or is it less about the diet? I guess it's mainly about alcohol. <laughs> but then I guess the second, th the second <laughs> thing would be is if you have insulin resistance, look at reversing that. So that would be identifying insulin resistance or prediabetes. Re reversing that sometimes requires taking a good hard look at sugar and yep. what what's happening with sugar, especially if there's like extreme sugar binging, which is real for some women. And I'm just, I'm just acknowledging that that's, i I know that is happening with my patients. I'm very sympathetic to that. So trying to be free of that or find a way out of the grip of sugar addiction can really make a difference. Yeah. And understanding what 
what you know all the sugars are not just yeah. sweet sugar it can be it can be bread and things like that yeah. too that could potentially still respond the same in our bodies mm. um and of course there's such an emotional component there so you can imagine a woman who is going through these ups and downs experiencing n- not a, a pleasant transition through menopause um potentially feeling the need for food for comfort for sure yeah. Okay. Thank you, Lara. Um, is there, um, what was I going to say? Oh yes. Yeah. So where can we find you? Yes. Where can we get your book? <laughs> <laughs> I'm easy to find. Um, my blog is larabryden.com. I'm going to try to start writing some new blog posts this year. So people should definitely subscribe and tune in there. All my social media is at Lara Bryden. And my book, my new book that we've been talking about is called Hormone Repair Manual. It's on shelves, in, especially in Australia and New Zealand. It's pretty easy to find. It's on Amazon. It's kind of everywhere. Fantastic. So. I'm so excited to tell everyone about it. And I'll have all the links to that information in the show notes. Thank you so much, Thanks. Lara. It's always a pleasure to chat with you. And um, I look forward to hopefully having you again on the show. Yeah. <laughs> it was great to see you again, Georgie. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. If you're ready for the deep dive into this work to master your anxious mind, I invite you to join the Anxiety Reset Program. Over 90 days, I'll be guiding you on how to build your mental resilience, reprogram those limiting beliefs that keep you stuck in self-doubt, heal your gut, balance your hormones, nourish your mind, body, and soul. Using a combined approach of naturopathy, nutrition, hypnotherapy, and live group coaching with me, you'll feel supported and motivated to show up for yourself consistently day after day. And this is how you will experience extraordinary results. You can master your anxious mind. The best time to begin is right now. Let's do it together. You'll find the link to learn more in the show notes. Thank you for listening. We have reached the end of this episode. If you enjoy this podcast and you find it helpful, I would really appreciate it if you would hit subscribe or share this episode on your Instagram stories and make sure you tag at Georgie the naturopath. But that is all for today. Please be kind to yourselves. Know that you are enough and you are exactly where you need to be. Thank you.